Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, April 8th. Today's topic is Breakout EDU. Our special guest is Adam Bello. I'm one of the co-moderators, Lori Moffat, as well as Peggy George, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing the closed captioning for us. I'm going to turn the mic over to Paula, who will now introduce Adam Bello, our special guest and ask him the newbie question. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today on Classroom 2.0 Live. Um, and I am so thrilled to introduce Adam. Adam Bello is a dedicated educational technologist and father of two young boys. Adam is the co-founder of Breakout EDU, the immersive gaming platform that enables teachers and students to turn their classrooms into a place of discovery and inquiry-based learning. Before that, he served as a Presidential Innovation Fellow for the White House. Over the past decade, Adam has created several popular EdTech learning platforms, including EduTecher, EduClipper, and We Learned It. He has written several books about educational technology and he is also serving as a board member for the EdCamp Foundation, in addition to speaking internationally about education and the power of technology to enhance learning. Adam and I first met in person at ISTE in Denver in 2010. And then for ISTE 2012 in, in San Diego and th um, 2013 in San Antonio, we got to share a house with some close members of our PLN while attending the conference. This year in February, Adam and I got to spend some time together at TCEA while we were both presenting on Breakout EDU. I love his warm and endearing personality and how he makes friends with everyone he meets. He is truly an inspiring and dedicated man to the field of education. It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you my friend Adam Bello, the co-founder of Breakout EDU. So, Mr. Adam Bello, <laughs> our newbie question for you is, what inspired the creation of Breakout EDU? Well, first of all, I have to pause before I answer any questions and say thank you. I don't know how much my mom pays you, but uh, that was the nicest introduction, and I, I really very, very much appreciate it. I'm so glad to be here with everybody. Um, so thank you for the kind words, Paula, and uh, uh, hello everybody and wel welcome. Um, based on the questions that uh, you answered before the, the recording uh, about your knowledge of Breakout EDU, I'm going to try to, you know, hopefully this will fit in the sweet spot of being a good introduction to the platform. And that jumping right into the newbie question, we're going to deep, deep dive into like the story behind it. But the inspiration of Breakout EDU is that uh, my good friend, the co-founder of the company, James Sanders, um, had gone to an escape room, and we'll go into the details of that later. And he calls me up and says, uh, I have this idea. I went to this place yesterday, and uh, I want to do this, this idea. And he describes what it is. And I think my initial reaction was, dude, I think that's crazy. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't until uh, you know, hearing about it a little more and seeing the very first test you know, run of Breakout EDU before it was a box or anything else that I was like, wow, <laughs> I, I am in. And, uh, and it really has been just an incredible journey. So we'll talk more about the creation uh, in, in just a little bit, but that's the, the initial seed of it. Uh, I think, am I advancing now? I'm going to go right in, I guess. So without further ado, uh, let's talk about Breakout EDU. So again, happy to be here on Twitter. I'm at Adam Bello. Our company is just Breakout EDU on Twitter, so at Breakout EDU. And hi, so it's a pleasure to be back. I haven't done a Classroom 2.0 Live in quite, uh, quite a while. I guess 2014 was the last one. But uh, it's always a pleasure being here, especially on Saturday. It's kind of that Ed Camp vibe of people that really are just genuinely entrenched in what they want to, you know, in their profession and want to learn more and share. And I, I love the fact that everyone's here. So thank you for having me uh, on Twitter. Uh, we can follow along at, at hashtag breakout EDU or I think uh, the hashtag for Class two to classroom 2.0 live, or 2.0 live, I should say. Uh, so I'll be following both of those and happy to answer any questions that, that come either on a recording or uh, afterwards or 
so anyway, the agenda for today, we uh, are going to go over some context as to you know, how, how we get to this conversation about gaming in the classroom, why breakout edu, what is breakout edu, and how to start doing breakout edu. And then I'm more than happy to take a whole bunch of questions. There will be plenty of time to, uh, you know, if you guys want to have any questions for me. So let, let's start with a little context. Um, you know, I'm not going to ask you to answer in the chat. If you want to, that's fine. But how many of you play games? My guess is that a smaller percentage of you would say yes than I think is true. And it's because games, you know, have a different connotation for everybody. Some people, you know, think about the nerd culture of playing games in your basement. Um, this could have been lifted out of my own childhood. Uh, although I only have one friend, not two. So, uh, but uh, playing games is, is definitely something that's been around for a very long time. I do remember Dungeons and Dragons. Many of you can relate to playing games like this, you know, Candy Crush. Uh, please don't invite me via Facebook to play with you. I've never played Candy Crush. I'm pretty proud of that fact. Um, but games are obviously everywhere in the culture. So when you talk about video games, people say, oh, I remember my first Nintendo game. Well, a lot of people have this as their memory, but it wasn't. It wasn't Super Mario Brothers. It wasn't Duck Hunt. Uh, the first playing, uh, the first Nintendo game was actually a playing card game because that's what the company started as. So many years ago, this was the first Nintendo game. Uh, I didn't play it, and uh, I don't know what it's about, but it looks fascinating. Uh, they went out to do Pokemon cards, so they've been in the card business for quite a while, Nintendo. And games, games have been around forever. So if you think about uh, this is the first recorded game called Senate or Passing, depending on who you talk to, and it's from around 1069 to 1550 BC, again, depending on your source. But games are everywhere in our culture. As a, as a dad of two awesome kids, uh, I spend my free times in the evenings and, and uh, on the weekends sometimes playing one of these games. And games are, are really important. In fact, my son even uh, got started with his video games early. This was us playing Rock Band um, way back when. So, so people are born gamers, I think. And, and today it certainly is, uh, <laughs> is appropriate. Pokemon Go, as you know, last summer was all the rage. And uh, the interesting fact about Pokemon Go is that 2.9 million miles were walked in just six weeks. Um, that's pretty amazing for a culture where walking is <laughs> it's not always the, uh, the, the most important thing in the family over here. Uh, then Pokemon, people, people even got into a business, right? Pokemon trainers, hire them for $20 an hour or, or buy Pokemon uh, uh, the themed snacks. So games have been everywhere. We talk about Minecraft and education and there's even holy Bibles for Minecrafters and really interesting stuff. And I feel if you can gamify religion, you can gamify anything. This is Adam Clark, who's wizard keen on, on uh, Minecraft. He created the human body just using Minecraft bricks. And kids have been doing stuff with Minecraft for a long time. So all of this is going to say that games and gamification has been around for a long time. And this is a game that I created. This is the first game I made for my classroom. Uh, this was made in 2002. Um, and this game is called Manhattan Math. And it, I remember spending very, very many hours on the weekends designing this game and making it pretty and cutting out cards. Um, but it wasn't a game. It, it was a worksheet. It wasn't fun. I mean, it, it was guised as fun. It was one of those things where you would roll a die and you would move the little marker and then you would answer a math question. And then you'd either go ahead or you'd stay there. So very sneaky, but not real game. Right? It was, it was lipstick on the pig, as they say. And you know, I, I think that that's it, we've come a long way, and that's why I look at Breakout of You as being so important. And, and this is kind of some of the reasons why. And this is not something that we created. Um, a good, uh, amazing community member, Maria Galanis, um, she had just taken to the platform and had come up with a list of things. And then Sylvia Duckworth, who does incredible um, you know, visualizations and, and uh, you know, infographic style or um, you know, just amazing artwork, has, has design this. And uh, we share it because I think it kind of encapsulates some of the major points that we, um, you know, that, that we love about this, right? So in this sketch note, it kind of talks about some of the main points. And I'll, I'll elaborate on these. I'm not going to read them through. But I just, I love that this graphic um, was put out there. And, you know, when you think about why break you, I think about some of the real problems that, that are out there in the education space. And, you know, having worked on products that are digital in nature and then focus on, you know, allowing kids to create behind a screen, there are still problems that, that are not solved by those digital technologies. And one is just boredom, right? So you have boredom. 
Um, you have kids that are that are coming home. I still ask my kids every day, "What did you do in school?" And the answer, of course, is just as every other kid, nothing, which, <laughs> which is pretty amazing. And for the teachers that are on the call, it's like, come on. I, I don't know. I, I feel like my, my kids should go home with a note saying, this is what we did, just because some talking points as to what actually happened. Um, you know, the other, the other thing with school is that a lot of times kids are, are told to just be quiet. You know, we got to get through the lesson. And uh, that's, that's kind of scary when you think about it. And you might be saying, well, that's only in the movies. Those are extreme. Uh, examples of what school could be like. And I think that unfortunately that's not always true. Um, I've been in enough schools and been in enough places in the world to know that there, this is the case for many schools, at least for a large proportion of the day, or a larger proportion than it should be for the day. Um, so we, uh, we kind of look at that and say, we don't want to, we're combating a system, right, where, where the bell would ring and a kid would sit in a desk in a row and stare at the teacher and, and go through the lessons, even an amazing teacher, even a compelling situation, how can we make that better? Because the worst thing I could think of is my, my kids sitting in their classrooms looking up at the sky saying only 11 more years, right? Um, so it's time for something different. It really is. And, and that's where we get into what Breakout EDU is. So Breakout EDU, as I said, was based on this concept of the escape room. And as I mentioned, uh, Jane Sanders goes to an escape room up in Canada and uh, he said the, uh, the idea of the escape room is you go and you pay money to basically get out of the room. So you're locked inside of a room, you have to search for clues, you have to think about what to do, solve problems, and then escape. And you have an hour to do so. And it's not guaranteed that you'll break out. So it's a really interesting concept. And as I told you, when he told me the idea, I'm like, that sounds nuts. Um, but it, it didn't take long to realize that it was just pure genius. So, Breakout EDU has evolved into an immersive learning games platform and it focuses around a Breakout EDU kit which uh, you can use to facilitate games where all different types of players and ages use critical thinking skills to solve a series of challenging puzzles in order to open a locked box. And there are games available for all ages and all content areas as well as the fact that we provide tools for people to be able to create their own games and share them. And uh, you know, Based on the idea of an escape room, you might think, okay, well, how does it work? Do you lock kids in the classroom? And obviously, we learned pretty quickly that locking kids in the classroom was probably not as good of an idea as we, we originally had thought. Uh, although some teachers on the call might think that would be working out. All right. So when I first played Breakout EDU, the first game that was ever played was in a, a backpack that was locked up. And it evolved when Mark Hammonds came up with the idea of saying, oh, let's put it inside of a wooden box. So these handmade wooden boxes. And this is how the company started with creating wooden boxes. And uh, this is one shown here. And you might say, well, what's in the box, right? Like what, what, what's in there? Uh, the box contains a whole series of resettable and reusable items. And this is just a, a showing you a picture of some of the items that are in the current box. Um, it's with these tools that you are able to create any of the games that we have on our platform. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But the items here, obviously, they're, they're generic in nature, you know, locks and, and USB drives and, and certain other items over here. And we can talk more in detail about it. But the magic happens when you set up a game and you let the students actually engage in a way that they often don't in class. Um, and again, as I said, I, I can kind of disparage my own, my own work and say that focusing on digital and focusing only on creativity behind the screen is, is um, you know, I, I think I realized how much is missing in that experience and how much of what I want for my own kids' education can be, uh, you know, basically derived from an experience like Breakout EDU. So Breakout EDU, uh, the idea is that we started with a couple of games. There was a game or two that we created at first and then the, the kind of the template idea of saying, oh, you can make your own games was put out there. And an amazing educator out of Michigan, uh, Patty Harju, who um, Patty just came on board and started making games for her classroom. She was teaching um, young kids, I think second grade, and, and it was just incredible to see the games she was creating for her class. And all of a sudden, um, we started to see more and more games pop up. And we had a sandbox of games where people were sharing games that they hadn't even tested yet that they wanted people to test. And we had games for every age group and every subject, and, and the games library started to grow, which was really exciting. Um, it's now a library of over 350 games, and we're adding more on an almost daily basis or daily basis. 
and you know we have Patty actually is hired as our director of games, and Patty is is helping to get all these people's games up and running on the platform. And when you say game, you know the the initial thing is fun, right? And I would say that the answer is these are fun. Um, this, in fact, is a picture from my son's second grade class. This was last year. I went in and did a game that uh, Mark Hammonds and I created called Attack of the Locks, and the faces of these kids was just amazing. And the teacher was like, "Wow, I've never seen them so happy." <laughs> and you know, as the dad of one of the kids in the class, I was like, "I hope they're pretty happy," <laughs> you know. But um, this was this was just one of those moments where I was like, "This is a magical experience, and it's wonderful to see." Uh, students both participating in and building games like this. So I think Breakout EDU helps to prove that learning and fun are not antonyms, that we really have the ability to create these opportunities in the classroom that are engaging and enjoyable, but at the same point are valid learning experiences. Uh, I think Breakout EDU, on top of whatever the content of the game is, whatever the game is actually either reviewing or trying to introduce as a topic or teach, uh, the, the idea that there are um, you know, these four C's that we talk about a lot in education. You know, we talk about collaboration, creativity, communication, and critical thinking. And it's one of those buzzword things that I think in the space of ed tech and in education in, in general, it's been hard to kind of capture this. It's been hard to kind of assess it. And I don't mean assess in a negative sense. I just mean to get a situation where it automatically comes out. So I think that Break EDU really brings those out because you cannot have a Break EDU game without those, um, those elements in there. So we'll get into the how in just a little bit. I guess I can give you a tease of it now. But how do you play a break at a new game? And this is kind of how those, those uh, elements come about. Is you would look around for clues and artifacts that are going to help provide information that you need to figure out what the combinations are to the locks. The box is locked up with a series of locks, up to five or six locks, if you will. And then you would talk, right? So the idea is that you would talk with a group, it's small groups. Usually we have groups of, you know, whether it's a whole class doing it or you have the class broken up into smaller groups, they have to come up with what do they think the clues mean? Where do they think it's going to lead to next? How do they break into that box? And then they test what they know. So they try combinations and if you don't get it, you try it again. If you're wrong, you just try <laughs> think a little more and try it again. And then the goal, of course, the ultimate goal of the game is to open up uh, remove all the locks and then open up the breakout EDU kit before the timer runs out. So you are able to kind of open up this box and see what is inside. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But getting back to those four C's, the idea is that the, there are tips that we give all the players for success. And a lot of these slides or these parts of these slides have been lifted from our facilitation deck, which I'll talk about in a moment. But um, these are tips you would tell the kids, right? The idea is that you're going to work as a team. And if you collaborate and you communicate really well, the better chances you'll be successful about it. Um, and if you solve something, and this is an important one because kids are running around excited to solve different puzzles, um, but if people are broken up to work on different parts of the problem or different locks on the box or different artifacts in the room, we want them to come together and make sure that everyone knows how they derived at what the answer was, um, not just to hear a cheer and say, oh, the lock came off. Well, great. Let's, let's everyone know exactly what happened. And then there are hint cards that we give with every kit. And the hint cards are put out there for when the students are able to ask for help. So they would come together and they have to kind of decide on when they need a hint. So we'll talk a little bit more about each of those elements in a bit. And it's been amazing because we've seen people playing Breakout EDU literally all over the world. It's a small project for a company of four. Um, and for all former educators. And our goal is really just to create a better, uh, a better tool for learning, to, to create an experience for these kids and an opportunity to build a platform where people are creating experiences that are both engaging and are also valid for classroom experience um, making a difference. One of the big things, you know, James and I talked about this a lot and a lot of people talk about seat time. You know, we don't like kids sitting in rows and you basically can't play a breakout EDU experience in your seat. Um, there are some digital elements to it. The games are a mix of physical and digital puzzles, but by and large, we want you up and around and looking up at things and um, this is just a screenshot from a video, but there's a video that James did of an early game he played where he just put the, uh, the camera in the back of the room and, and just let it record. And you see people wandering all over the place and forming new groups and going back to old groups. And it's really just an amazing experience. And the other piece of it is just, you know, we want kids to try. And we talk about failing forward and we talk about failure a lot in education. But, you know, I like to say that the success uh, is really the ability to go from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. And that's a Winston Churchill quote. 
And I think about that, and that's why my kids and I built an arcade, because I want them to fail. The games they play on their iPad these days, you could just go on and on and on forever. Um, but I want them to have that experience of getting out, so to speak, or we used to say dying, but that's pretty crazy. Um, we want kids to try, and, and I think that that's one of the biggest uh, benefits of playing Breakout of You with your kids is because you know, you could try a hundred times and you still have motivation. So every time a kid makes a tug at a lock, every time they pull on a, on a combination lock and they don't have it, they are not going to say, oh, all right, I'll, I'll take the beat. I don't get in. It's fine. I'll fail. They are so driven to get in there and, and to, to kind of crack the code for each of these individual locks. It's really amazing. Sometimes you could fail a hundred times a game and still be driven to say, oh, I know time ran out, but I really need to know. I want to try more. And uh, you know, it's the concept of respecting failure that allows you to embrace that creativity. I think that all kids are curious, and when you task them with get into this mystery box, you, you shroud it in a story and there's a reason to do it, you have now just you know, lit them on fire to say, all right, well, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it, and there's nobody that can stop me except yourself. <laughs> and that brings us to hints. Um, a lot of times, and I know I was so guilty of this as a teacher, I would go up to the students and say, oh, you look like you're struggling. Let me help you. That one's D. <laughs> you know, like get, give the overshare, the overhelp. But the hint cards that come with Breakout EDU, uh, they're literally just cards that say hint on them. But those are out there for when the teacher who's acting as the facilitator, who's literally watching the game unfold and watching their, their learners in a very, very different light, um, their, their job is not to go up there and help the kids, right? You know, they, they can't get into the four-digit lock. You're not to give them hints. What happens is, is that they have hint cards. And as, the, as a group, they can decide and say, look, we're at the point we don't get this. We're, we're either going to give up, we're getting frustrated. We think we've tried everything. Give us a hint. And the beauty of a hint card is that, again, it's just a piece of paper so that the facilitator, you, the teacher, gets to look at the students in the situation they're in and give them an appropriate help. So it's not the answer. But it could be as simple as connecting two students who may have pieces of the same uh, puzzle. So you would say, oh, you know what? Why don't you go talk to that person over there or that small group over here? Or maybe it's walking them through the steps that they got so far and then you know, kind of pointing them in the right direction. But it's a really wonderful way to kind of give help when you need it, you know, just in time. And as a former teacher, I have to say that the, the other large thing I love about this is the freedom. It's the freedom to realize that school can be done very differently. Um, we're all doing innovative things in the classroom. Everyone's trying new tools and new ideas. But this is freeing in a different sense. It frees you from that role of teacher. And I think it frees you also from uh, the idea that, that you can kind of have to do a canned curriculum in, in the day and age where teachers pay teachers and all these other people are, are downloading you know, uh, worksheets to give out. This is the idea where like, you can do two or three games from our platform and then start designing your own as well. And that is a really great uh, a great thing that we've seen a lot of educators take to. Uh, we uh, are very blessed to see a lot of tweets go out. You know, we love looking at Twitter and seeing all these people sharing it all over the world today. Uh, Mark Hammonds from our team was in Bahrain doing a game, and uh, Patty travels a fair bit and has done a bunch of ed camps. And you know, we we're so lucky to see Breakout EDU kind of being embraced in many different education spaces. Both the ones that we're all familiar with. I mean, obviously, if you're on Classroom 2 without a live, you know, you're you're <laughs> one of the early adopters, right? And uh, you know, you're probably wanting to get involved in things early. But we've seen this, to, you know, it, it's a box of locks that can really unlock, for no pun intended or pun intended, I guess, uh, you know, a lot of, of real thinking in the classroom. So we're very blessed to see this being shared. At the end of the game, we love taking a photo. <laughs> And kids love taking a photo too, whether they got out or not. So we have different photos. This was actually, this is my son over here wearing the uh, Darth Vader shirt, but this is him and his class in second grade when they broke out. And it's a lot of fun. And you might say, well, it's a lot of fun, but, but where's the learning, right? Where does it happen? Um, one of the things we created recently, uh, actually we created it in June and launched it back in November or December, was uh, a deck of cards. So again, if you thought our company was really innovative coming out with a box of locks of, you know, and it, we now created our second product which was a deck of cards. Um, but the deck of cards we, we really are so excited and proud of because they have questions on them that really deepens the learning experience. So, you know, the idea is that you could either lock them in the box, so instead of giving them candy or chocolate, this is the idea that these reflection cards, as they're called, would be locked in the box or handed out by the facilitator to, to each of the students or participants 
Um, and they have expressions on them. For example, you know, what did you learn about yourself during the game? If you could add one more sign, uh, one more question to the game, or one more lock to the box, what would it be and why? Um, how did you help out? You know, how did you help your team? What could be one thing you could do better next time? You know, those types of questions that really bring about conversation as well as um, you know, deep understanding of yourself, the game, and maybe even the content. We have content questions for the games that have been loaded out as well. So just recapping some of the power of Breakout EDU, and um, this is really what I love about it, is that it is active learning, right? It transfers that ownership of the learning from the teacher to the student. It's you know, that old sage on the stage, guide on the side thing. But in this case, it really it makes it very easy to do. There's, there's very little work. You can get out of the way very easily. Um, so you can observe the learners, you can see them approach their problem solving skills, and assess them in a very different way that's organic. And those four C's, you know, I'm not going to repeat them again, but I think that that's kind of one of those ways where it, you don't have to set it up. There's no, there, you know, you do tell them, yes, you're working together, but in reality, you're not really giving them any other cues than, than that. And the other part of it is, is that grit, you know, is the idea that they will fail 150 times, and it's a very different experience to pull on a lock and fail and try again than if I told you, oh, you're wrong. And or even in the nicest ways, someone telling you you're wrong is different than just the pulling on that lock. So um, how do you do this, right? So for, for those of you, I saw the poll in the beginning, a lot of people haven't done it yet, and that's totally fine. We, we certainly welcome you to try it. It's one of those things that once you try it, there is that click of, wow, this is pretty magical. And the way it starts is, is you would buy a kit. We sell them at our store. It's store.breakoutedu.com. And once you have a kit of these resettable items, you can play all of our games. So the idea is that you would go on our games library, there's a password to get in, you would get into the games library, and then find a game that's suitable for you and set it up. There's detailed instructions, uh, there's a video, and there's any of the uh, other materials you need. So for a lot of the games require you to print out some stuff or to, um, you know, to, to hang something on the wall or write something in invisible ink, and there's detailed instructions on how to do that. And then it's just to facilitate it. And that's the best part is once you've done that, that little bit of work, you get to go in and uh, you get to see everyone uh, set this up and, and have the students experience it or the players experience it. And I will tell you, it, it's tremendous fun, although sometimes it's hard work to sit there and watch without giving away those hints. Some people are more generous than others in, uh, <laughs> in the type of hint. But I love the facilitation piece over there. So. Uh, that's, that's basically how you get started. And of course, if we're going to take questions in a bit. I'm happy to answer any of these things for you. So there is a dedicated games page, and uh, we've just recently relaunched this thanks to the hard work of the entire team. Um, we've moved all of our games over and made it even easier to find them as well as to get started with that. So there's a, a game search, and uh, the games pages break down like this. I wanted to share with you how they work. So for example, this is Time Warp, which is one of the first games created by Mark and James. And Time Warp's a lot of fun. The way that this works is, you know, we give you some brief tips and, and ideas about it, like what's the content area, how many, well, what's the recommended age group, how long do you think it would take, what's the basic story structure. And then we give you the, the real nitty gritty, like how do you set the locks? Well, here you would look up these combinations and set your locks to that, and then you would see the setup instructions, and you could do that, uh, and then print out the assets. So, a pro tip: if you're going to play Breakout Edu and you love it, which uh, I'm sure once you play it, you will you want to laminate these things because I can't even tell you how many times I've printed the same piece of paper. So that's kind of the only, uh, the only, only thing you have to do on your end is laminate those things, get them ready to go. And the tips and resources are really helpful because we, we provide a whole bunch of tools. We actually have a facilitation tool that's going to be coming, but it includes a breakout EDU timer. So it's a timer that counts down with some cool classical music. And uh, we have all the signs for you where you could say you almost broke out. And then there's other tips. So one of the most important things to get started um, would be the tutorials on how to set your locks. They are real locks. They are resettable. And you can do that pretty easily by following along with the video. So there's the link for that. And uh, hopefully that's clear. <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of different videos. There's also different tips that we've learned a tremendous amount. I have to pause here and just say, you know, we're four people on our team. We're educators. We're not you know, this big conglomerate company. We learn from the community of people that are embracing this in classrooms every day. There's a rabid Facebook community with thousands of people on it that are sharing ideas and you know, making us better at what we do. And one of the ideas is this locks parking lot. And the idea here is that when the lock comes off the box, you put it on the piece of paper. 
And it's such a simple thing, but it winds up preventing students from, you know, fiddling with the locks and resetting them because they're real. And if you reset them, um, you know, you might not know the combination to get back in. So this is one of those great ways to, to kind of prevent that. Um, but th these are these are again tips and tricks that we've dreamed up based on the conversations that have happened in our communities. And we love the idea of designing and sharing games. So there are students all over the world, there are teachers all over the world that are starting to design and share games. And we're going to be doing a lot more to give you better resources to do this in the near future. But we love to, to share out how to do this. So there's a template that's available. It's at breakedu.com slash create. And that is a template as long as a couple of uh, pieces of information on how to get started making your own. There's some great examples of puzzles. And I want to just pause here. I think this is one of my favorite puzzles in any of our games. It's, uh, it's from a game called Dr. Boar on the Quest for Hope. And um, you know, we, we love games that are challenging. They're not hard for the sake of being hard, but they're challenging. Um, you know, one of the things that you know, I love about this is that it could be or that it is more than a, a worksheet that's been turned into a series of questions. So for example, if I'm doing a math question and I have a lock that's a three digit lock, I wouldn't ask my students to add up three numbers to, to enter the three digit number. That's, that's not a challenge. But when you think of something over here, for example, this is a puzzle where what you have to do is there's a Powerball ticket somewhere in the room, and when you use the invisible ink, the invisible, uh, the UV pen rather, you would see what was written in this blank and some of the numbers are actually marked as geographic coordinates. And the geographic coordinates lead to a map. So if you put it in, you're allowed to use your devices. We encourage the fact that it blends digital and physical. So you would type it into Google and it would show you a map and they would say, where is this place? And if you figure it out, the, the game is about environmental disasters and it's about man-made environmental disasters and you know, this leads you to Chernobyl. So the date that Chernobyl happened, not the year, because the year is revealed on the card, but the date, uh, I think it was April 26th if I'm wrong, but anyway, so it's around there, um, is the, the answer. So it's again, just trying to make these connections to make the learning really, really deep but engaging and challenging as well. I'm not going to go through the time warp flow for you now, but I just wanted to show you that there's a, a lot of different ways to play in games. This was a, an example shared from Amanda in our Facebook community. And she was showing how she was using, um, I guess it was Pad, uh, not Padlet, uh, this was, oh gosh, um, Poplet to, uh, to create a, a really easy to use game flow, which, I, which is a lot of fun. Uh, we do have an iPad app also and an iPhone app. It's iOS only at the moment. It's called Locks and it allows you to create a single digital lock. So it could be anything, uh, text, numbers, directions, shapes, or colors and it could lead you to another piece of the, uh, of the game as well. So that's available now. Uh, I'm going to pause here with a quote that I, I absolutely love. This is probably my favorite quote of all time. And it talks directly about what I believe and also what I think we're, we're accomplishing in, um, in breakout EDU, right? And, and it's the idea that we must realize that the students are not in our classroom, but we're in theirs. And I think that that's really important. Um, so let's see, this is, um, uh, this, this is kind of a point where I would ask you to ask some questions because I think we have about 15 minutes left and I'm more than happy to kind of, I saw a bunch of questions go through in the chat, happy to answer anything uh, that I can and then um, elaborate on anything you'd like to know. Thanks Adam. Yes, I did capture questions. Great. How do you strategically create clues and time them to keep the momentum up but not build too much frustration? That's a great question. And I think that we look at, um, yeah, we look at the idea that you want to start with an easy win. I mean, not an easy win in the sense that like you immediately figure it out, but you know, the game should build in complexity. Mm -hmm. The idea that, um, you know, for example, in, in the Star Wars game that Mark Hammonds and I did, um, one of the clues was actually in the, the opening scroll of Star Wars. We created like a fake Star Wars scroll. And one of the clues is in that scroll. And, um, you know, again, it's very simple. It's kind of literally in your face. If you read the scroll carefully, you're able to figure it out. And um, from there, they, they get harder and harder. And I think that that's kind of the key of any good game is to, to start with something that's graspable. So, I mean, again, it's hard to give concrete examples other than the one I just gave mm -hmm. because every game will differ based on the curriculum or based on what you're trying to accomplish with it. But, you know, giving students something that they will solve probably in the first five to six minutes 
and then it kind of pushes them to say, oh, I could solve that one. So this other hard one that I don't know yet, you know, they have more, more drive and gas to go forward and, uh, and try that. Okay. Um, let's see. When you buy the kit, then do you have access to any of the games that are there, or do you have to pick one? No, so that's the best part about this is that you're, you're buying the kit gives you access to the platform. So okay. when you get a kit, you're able to, to access any of the games and the materials in the kit are able to be set up and re, uh, reset to work with any of those games that we offer. Great. In a class of 30, how many kits would you recommend to be most beneficial? Yeah, so we've been asked this question a bunch, and I think that mm -hmm. um, there's a bunch of different ways to handle that. So there are some teachers that, that can make it work with 30. I think that you know, in the situations I've been in with 30 people, uh, I would recommend two kits, maybe three. Um, you know, as, as practical advice, I would say start with two and then see if you need a third. My, the way I think about it is this way. Um, you want to have every kid be able to get around that box and try it, right? You, want, you don't want to build a wall of children because the people that are in the third row of that wall are not going to have the same experience of pulling on the lock and trying to unlock it and try their ideas. Sure. So that is really one of those things. I think it's, it's think of your kids, how big are they? You know, like, <laughs> I, I know size of students does matter here. And I, I would say you know, 10 in a group is probably perfect. Mm -hmm. So three would be great. But again, you know, we're not trying to push people to buy more. Mm -hmm. If you can get two kit, two boxes, I think that that's a great place to start and then see if you need another. Great. When a game says whole class, is there a recommended maximum number of students? Yeah, it really depends. I mean, when we say whole class, it does mean that you could do it with up to 30 students. Um, we, we do feel, though, that there's always, you know, if you can make it a slightly more intimate group, if you can make it slightly smaller, it probably will benefit everyone. So that is, uh, that is definitely there. And, and again, it's one of those things you can try it mm -hmm. and, and moderate it. There are people that have come up with different methods to deal with this, like a, they call it the ticket method, where there are people that um, have the ability for, uh, you know, for, for students to write down what they think the answer is, and then they get turns to go up and try it. You know, again, if, if you're able to, having more boxes available so that the students can actually get together in small groups and do it, is, I think, beneficial. Uh, does it, do you have any advice for the startup facilitator that is on time or other things to prep before a, a session? Somebody who's doing this for the first time, I think, is, is the question. Yeah, no, my, I, yeah, totally understand. So, we have, we have really gone out of our way this past two months to, to make getting started with it even easier, and we continue to do so. Um, the ultimate tip is to make sure you watch the tutorial videos on how to set the locks. Mm -hmm. I think that that's really the biggest barrier to entry, um, is that people you know, sometimes just think they can figure it out. Uh, I think that the locks are, are something that you definitely want to watch the video. I think the other piece of it is watch the video for the game setup. Um, I know I'm a very visual learner. And having those videos where someone, the game creator in most cases, has gone through and shown you how they set up the game is super, super helpful. So just taking those maybe 10, 15 minutes to get everything ready to go will make the game run a lot smoother. Okay. Is there any way a group of, of online students can play Breakout EDU? Or perhaps is there an online alternative to Breakout EDU? Sure. So we, we do have games that are uh, digital Breakout EDU games. They're in beta. They're games that we're trying to figure out how to uh, make an even better experience. As I said, I think that the beauty of the Breakout EDU idea is that pulling on a lock on a physical thing and moving around and, and talking mm -hmm. is the, the key magic here. There are ways to do it digitally that are great. Um, we're actually coming up with a few interesting scenarios that will blend it a little further ourselves. But um, yeah, there, there are some beta digital games. But as I said, all of our games uh, mix having you know, online pieces, email, uh, forms, 
QR codes, all sorts of different things that involve technology that, uh, that are able to, to kind of bring it to the box as well. So it's both best of both worlds. Have many students created breakout games? They absolutely have. Um, we've heard of clubs where kids are creating breakout EDU games. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we internally, we've talked about this quite a bit in terms of like, do we want to create like a, a site where students can share their games? And, and the reality is, is that a student game that's good is no different from a, a teacher's game that's good. So we're, we're welcoming students to kind of create and share their games as long as it has, you know, the, the same elements in terms of explaining how they set it up and how they do it. We would love to share that and obviously, you know, I, I, we want that, that type of thinking, that type of problem solving, because what better way to express your understanding and knowledge of something than to be able to create a game for someone else that has to do the same. Can the game be stretched over time, that is a day or two? Yeah, I mean, we've, uh, we've seen a couple of examples of that. They absolutely can. There are different places where um, we've seen games stretched over over different locations. Mm -hmm. We've seen games that have run for multiple periods. Uh, you know, I would love a, a cross-collaborative <laughs> game where maybe the math, the science, the English and the social studies teacher, there's a, there's a theme or a story that I'm literally creating one in my head right mm -hmm. now with you, but maybe there's a story where uh, something happens in the character or whatever it is and it kind of goes across all different curriculum points. So maybe there's four different boxes or maybe one lock in each room. You certainly can come up with creative ways to make this an experience that lasts uh, you know, longer than a 45 minute period. Great. Has anyone used donors choose to purchase kits? They have. We, uh, we do see donors choose uh, ordering from us. We're, uh, we're talking to them. I know, I think at this point, I'm not 100% sure, but I believe that there's, you have to have like a certain level of donors choosing this to, <laughs> they're a little choosy about uh, getting it uh, from us. Mm -hmm. So we are we're trying to figure out how to how to do that better. But yes, we're you know we're welcome to those people. Uh, we've seen a lot of people write grants to to other organizations and other things as well. And um, you know we just love seeing it spread to different classrooms. And again, it's not always the early adopter classrooms. It's classrooms in different parts of the world. I know I was talking with um, with Ben Honeycutt who does some work in Africa and wants to share breakout of you with some of the schools there. We know we've been in a lot of other countries. It doesn't require tons and tons of technology. Mm -hmm. And at the same point, it uses technology, I think, in a way that's, that's really powerful. So it's super fun to see that. But yes, the answer, the answer about donors' shoes, yes, you could look at donors' shoes to see uh, if we're available through that. Is there a central place of clue creation ideas that has been curated? Uh, I know there's a great Pinterest board. Uh -huh. uh, I think that uh, Patty Haryu, who's actually in the in our chat, which is awesome. Hi, Patty. Mm -hmm. um, she might share that. If not, I can dig it up in a few minutes mm -hmm. and try to share that as well. Okay. But there's, I mean, people are sharing through our Facebook communities, and we also are doing, uh, you know, work on our end to kind of make it even easier to to share resources together in terms of clue ideas. I know James and Patty are are looking at doing a a design course that will be launching shortly. That, that kind of gives people more information and better tools on how to create games using the platform. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, have you considered any extensions, extensions of this, that is creating educational scavenger hunts or amazing races or similar ideas? Yeah, I mean, we've seen a lot of students. Uh, hey, Mark. <laughs> I see that that's Mark's mm -hmm. question. Uh, yeah, we've seen a lot of schools and, and uh, camps and students using this in different ways. So they kind of take break out of you and they and they uh, make it exactly like that. I mean, there's there's not much that needs to uh, be altered to allow it to create those types of things. We've mm -hmm. seen it done as a uh, as you know, quote unquote, the amazing race. You know, something doing a um, you know, like a time school wide event and and other things like that. The, the nice thing again is that it's all focused around the central idea that using these creative thinking puzzles you can actually get into this box. So we've seen competitions, we've seen a whole bunch of other ideas come out of that and certainly welcome those, those things as well. 
at the secondary level, what's been the best avenue to get students from sharing too much information across periods? Oh, so there you go. This is a question I get quite a bit as a former high school teacher. Uh -huh. I get that. Um, I, you know, there, there's a couple of thoughts here. One is, you know, I used to tell my class, <laughs> you know, when we would do something that was an activity that they really loved and they would share too much, uh, I would just say to them, well, we can go back to our quizzes and we can go back to our, you know, lecture, mm -hmm. or you, you can keep this to yourself and, and not ruin it for anyone else. It's like movie spoilers, right? You don't want to mm -hmm. spoil the end of the movie. Um, the other way to do it is I know some high school classes do leaderboards. I mean, they're at an age where they could they could have a little competition. I don't think I would do this with a <laughs> with, with an elementary school class, although maybe. But high school class, you know, if there's five sections of AP calculus and you're doing a game, you might want to have a competition between those five courses and see who gets out faster. Therefore, you wouldn't want to give out the answers so they wouldn't beat your time. Um, and and to be honest with you, like I always go back to the idea that when I was a little kid playing Nintendo, they had this thing called Game Genie. And Game Genie, when you stuck it inside your cartridge of Nintendo, you can get unlimited Mario lives or Contra lives or whatever game it was. And when you beat it that way, it's really a cheap experience, you know? <laughs> you, you don't want to kind of ruin the experience and fun for yourself as well. Can you provide training for teachers? Uh, yeah, we can. Uh, we certainly provide a whole bunch of information on mm -hmm. our site. We also um, just launched an authorized trainer program. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for teachers that are really interested and also very well versed at sharing for Get mm -hmm. you to uh, apply to that. The cohort will be announced in mid-May. That's on our site. It's uh, breakedu.com/trainer, and. Um, you know, we, we are open to opportunities where we come out and share break out of you with other people, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, you know in person or, or virtually as well. If you buy a box, do you get access to more games than what is posted on the website? So the the website has all of our mm -hmm. games that are posted there. It's uh, about three hundred and fifty games or so, and we are adding, as I said, or when I say we, I should say Patty, who's <laughs> in the chat, is very diligently adding games as quickly as she can. Mm -hmm. So I know we have a whole bunch of new games going up each week, and we have some big plans for that as well. So you do get access with the with the kit to um, to the games that we have on the platform. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to turn the mic over to Paula. She's been waiting patiently with her hand raised. Go ahead, Paula. Sure. Um, I just want to say that um, I know that the first time I learned about Breakout EDU, it was at an ed camp, and um, I played the game. And basically, we were given a little backstory, and there was the box sitting there, and then that was it. We were just let loose in this room and asked to <laughs> figure out the clues and break into the box. And I can remember we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know what to. And then things just started coming together. And it makes you really collaborate and, and pay attention to everyone's voice. Because um, when I started facilitating the games for professional development, I remember one of my first groups, there was a very quiet young lady that kind of stood in the back and, and said some wonderful ideas. But she was very quiet, so the group didn't listen to her. So when I was handed a hint card from that group, I said, you need to listen to everyone in your group. <laughs> and I kind of looked very pointedly at this one particular person. And when they listened to her, <laughs> then they were able to put together what she was saying and break in. So it's really interesting. And I say um, one of my favorite parts of the game, Adam, is to at the end do the debriefing questions with them and really get them thinking about, you know, what worked, what didn't, um, who was, you know, who were the leaders, who were the ones that kind of held back and weren't sure. And it's really interesting to watch a group of fourth graders play this because um, of things we do through the, throughout our school. They are very good at letting each other practice, uh, play with opening the locks. Um, they give each other turns. If each one of them wants to open the, the lock, it's okay. And the way that I play it is with a one box, and I set up stations around my classroom. 
um, where the kids are um, getting the clues at each station. They have a slip of paper where they record. When they think they have a combination figured out, they can go up to the box and try it. And if it opens the lock, great. They, they can check that one off. They relock the lock and they go on to the next station. And I even have um, a couple that have red herrings in them. I've actually printed out pictures of red herrings. And sometimes they might have to collect two red herrings. Some games they might have to have three. They never know how many red herrings they have to get. So one group one time saw that one of the stations didn't lead to a lock combination, so they skipped it. They were like, oh, that's just a red herring. We're not going to that station. Well, they got, <laughs> they got to me and they said, oh, we won. We figured out all the locks. And I went, so where are your red herrings? And they went, what? I said, you also have to turn in the right number of red herrings to win. So they, they learn a lot of lessons. But being a facilitator keeps you on your toes, too, because you have to be listening to what's going on with each group so that you can give them the right hint without giving them too much. Absolutely love it. And we love playing the games. I love creating the games. And one of these days, I might even have my students do so. That's really great. I mean, it, it, it is for that reason that, I mean, every single day, um, I, I feel truly honored and, and just so excited to be a part of this amazing community. You know, we, as I said, it's a company of four educators, and we are just bent on, you know, helping to, to make classrooms even more dynamic and engaging. And we're so excited and so honored to see so many people taking this up as a, as a new way of learning. So it's, it's a lot of fun. And I love hearing you talk about it, Paul. That's awesome. And Adam, there's another question here. Uh, what are some examples of sure. teachers using Breakout EDU for professional development? Do you have examples of that? Yeah, absolutely. So we, um, you know, one of the, the great things about Breakout EDU is that once you see it, you totally mm -hmm. get it. I mean, obviously, you've sat in here and listened to me chat with you for an hour. Hopefully, everyone has a good idea about what it is. But those of you that are still curious and saying, all right, I kind of get the idea, uh, need to experience it, need to see it. And that's why um, we love seeing people doing it at professional development meetings. In fact, Patty last summer created a game um, called the faculty meeting. And it's a great way to introduce breakout ED to your faculty. It's, it's intended to be played at a staff meeting. And it's great for PD. It's kind of explaining to you what breakout EDU is while you're immersed in playing one. And the idea of that game is that the, the bottom part of the agenda for the staff meeting has been locked in the box. And you can't leave the room until you break in and, and retrieve it. So <laughs> lots of fun. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we've, seen, we've seen people using that for professional development. We're also, as I said, focused on, on allowing people to not only play the games, but also learn how to start creating games and sharing that with students as well. That's terrific. Um, I do want to ask uh, those of you that have done sessions, games of Breakout EDU, if, you, if any of you are willing to take the mic, uh, this is always a great place and safe place to share your experiences. So if you want to do that, please raise your hand. That's a little hand icon that's at the very top of the participants window and we'll give you the mic to allow you to share. Those were the questions that I was able to, to find. OK, Patty, you now have the mic. Thanks so much for volunteering. Go ahead. You click on the talk button. Underneath where it says audio and video, you found it. Great. Am I in now? You sure are. Um, I'll just share a couple um, experiences. You know, I have a little gal in my room last year who, Frances, who if you gave her an assignment at her seat, it was done perfectly, perfect handwriting, um, always knew what to do, uh, A's on everything. When she came into a breakout situation, um, she would take one look and look at me and say, I don't get it. And so for Frances, it was a great experience in having her try and figure it out, look at the clues. I would just say, you have everything you need in front of you. Um, 
and walk away. She often walk, would walk away and then her group would have to come back. And so it was really interesting to see the students in my class um, work on problem solving. Um, I put them in all different groups. Uh, those firstborns often had a little trouble finding a leader. Um, I had another little student, Michael, who, if it was work at his desk, was not engaged. I would say he was engaged about 7% to any work at his desk. But when we were playing breakouts, he was in the midst of it. And he was solving problems, and he was working. So I just saw some great things happening with my younger students. Um, it's also great fun to watch adults and listen to them problem solve um, through the breakout process. Any other questions you have, or is that good? Thanks, Patty. Uh, does anyone else want to share their experience with breakout? Okay, Paula, you already have the mic. Go ahead. Um, and one other thing I wanted to share, um, I'm sure this happens in a, in a lot of grade levels, but there are two things that the kids absolutely love at the elementary level. One is when you hide the key that opens the regular key lock um, somewhere that, you know, the clues lead them either to the key or something like that. They, they love that, you know, tape it under a desk, under a bookcase, something. They love that. And then the kids love the black light flashlight and any clues that you can create where you use that, you know, if you, even if you have to have several of them. I bought a pack of, um, I think it was, I don't know, a dozen of them for a fairly cheap price on Amazon. Um, and the kids, every one of the kids wants to touch that black light flashlight and find a clue. So I, I try to incorporate a lot of that into it. And be careful that you set parameters with your students. Adults are very cautious when they're in a space and they're not going to rip everything apart. The same cannot be said with kids. They will go in there and literally tear your room apart if you don't set proper boundaries. So have that discussion before you turn them loose. Thanks so much. Oh, you'd be surprised. I'm sorry. Adam. I, I was just going to add. You, you, that's a great. That's a great tip, Paula. Uh, but you'd be surprised. I once did this at the end of a trip. So I checked out of a hotel and I forgot to tell people not to go through my suitcase <laughs> that was in the back of the room. The next thing I know, my laundry is being looked through and you know, black lights. And it was quite the experience. Hmm. Uh, yes. Thanks so much for those those tips, Paula. Louise, you now have the mic. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. I am a middle school teacher. I've met some of you before. And, um, when I met you before, I was a second grade teacher, but I moved up to a middle school. It's a STEAM middle school in Burleson, Texas. And so we don't sit in rows. We don't um, do some of the things that Adam talks about. So um, we try to do as many innovative things at our school as possible. I introduced Breakout EDU uh, after going to an EdCamp Foundation um, session and meeting Patty Haru and doing the breakout there. Um, the way that I introduced it to our staff was by creating a breakout for our principal's baby shower. He, he was having a, a, a baby. He and his wife were having a baby. And so I created this breakout EDU for everybody to participate in with clues about the baby's weight and birth and all that kind of stuff. So that was really a fun way to do that. <clears throat> and then our band director uh, kind of took off with it and created a breakout for his classes. Um, he taped, uh, you know, the key onto the bottom of the xylophone, you know, so they had to find out which, you know, which note they needed to get to to find that key. And so they had a lot of fun with that. And then um, I had a group of eighth graders create a breakout EDU for uh, some of our sixth and seventh graders. They were creating games for sixth and seventh graders um, on math skills that they had already learned. The eighth graders had already learned, and so they were creating it for younger kids. And so one of the groups created a breakout EDU. So that was really fun to watch them kind of work through that and, and problem solve that. Because it isn't, it isn't easy creating breakout EDUs. I mean, they can be pretty, you know, you want to make them challenging, but you don't want to make them 
uh, you don't want to make them too easy. You know what I mean? So it's it's a uh, it is that that is kind of the challenge that I have with with, the, with creating them. And then one of our uh, our seventh grade uh, Texas history teacher, uh, we don't use textbooks at our school, but we have a stack of them, you know, that we have issued. But we're one to one Chromebooks, and we use a lot of primary sources and and online digital things. But Breakout Edu is a way to get unplugged. So um, this teacher created this Breakout Edu, and they had the students had to use the textbook find a clue because it's very easy to Google, you know, Texas history facts. So this required them to actually open the book and, and look for it. And so and this teacher is also really good at managing it. <coughs> so, you know, there's a bucket where you put the locks uh, while they're still unlocked. Um, you know, she also has created some kind of a Google form where they actually have to go in and fill out all of the clues. So then that way they, you know, sort of accountability so that she knows that you know, the, that they've done it and they've turned it in. So she's, she's created some really good um, systems and put some good systems in place for managing the, the breakout EDU. So I was just really pleased to see that my teachers have taken hold of it and I hope that they continue to do more. That's awesome, Louise. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Louise. Um, Jackie Paula asked if you'd like to share. Um, Is Jackie still here? I'm not sure if I see Jackie at the moment. Oh, she is? Okay. At the top. Oh, right. Yes. Oh, you shared your blog post. Would you like to get on the mic and share? Okay. The talk button is up near the very top of the window. Go ahead and click that after you have the mic. Now you have the mic. We ought to be able to hear you. It's a big button above the word participants or in that area. On the top left corner of the window. Hmm. Well, you have the mic. Maybe you don't have a mic connected at the moment. Is that the case? There we go. There you have it. Hi. Hi, we can hear you fine. I was clicking, yeah, I was clicking on the little grade mic next to my. I mic. see. Okay, not the big talk button. Common yeah. error. Yes, that's that's fine. It's all right, Peggy, help. <laughs> Thanks, Peggy. Peggy's a great rescuer. Yeah, no, I've had a lot of fun. I took Patty's. I think she saw it. I took Patty's. All oh, the places they go. So. And then I did it to Egbert, the slightly cracked egg, because I work with gifted kids, and I want to normalize that they're not, they're not normal. And I like, I like that they're kind of weird, and they like that they're kind of weird. So, yeah, Patty did a great job in all, all the places you'll go. And my students really love it, the game. And I do it a little differently than, than folks describe. I actually have a worksheet, which I put into the chat. And I have them work in small groups, and all the small groups have to come up with the solution before they could go to the lock because they only have one lock box. So it does slow it down a little bit, but then they really, then one group when one group gets it, I tell them to go over and help the other groups by not giving them the answer, but giving them little hints. So it's, it's kind of, a, like I said, a different model, but I. I really want all the kids involved, and if one kid gets it quicker, or one group gets it quicker, then um, then it still allows everybody to be part of that process. And then a couple weeks ago, I did I, I was doing coding unit, and what's that one called, Patty or Adam? The code one where the kids have to do uh, it looks like Twister, and it looks like. 
Yes, there we go. Caught in the code. And I had a Saturday <laughs> program and a kids program, and they really, really, thanks, Peggy, they loved it. So they just love it. And I put in, um, like, the, this is the last piece I want to share because I thought it was pretty powerful. Uh, Adam was talking about the processing cards, and I come from a background that I believe processing and debriefing is really important. And for the egg bird, I put in silly putty eggs, and they all got silly putty eggs when they broke when they got into the box and then they had to create something out of the silly putty that makes them unique and then we did a share for that. So I do like including some kind of follow-up and debrief. That's great. Yeah, that's, that's really the magic is. It's like having that conversation. Thanks so much for sharing, Jackie. Those were the questions I was able to capture, Adam. Um, as well as, of course, the, the people that volunteered to get on the mic. Thanks so much. I'm going to go ahead and turn the mic over to Peggy, who will tell us what's coming up next. Well, Adam, you never disappoint, and this was fantastic. I know that people are going to want to watch this again to get these tips one more time and to share them with other teachers. So thank you so much for sharing with us. And a big thank you to everyone who had the courage to take the mic and share with us, and to all of you that shared your links in the chat. I'll make sure that those links get added to the live binder. So thanks a lot. Just a quick uh, closing here to say, remember, we won't have a show next weekend because that's Easter holiday weekend here in the United States. But following that, we have a great show coming up with Steve Garten from Common Sense Media that will continue our conversation about digital citizenship and raising digital kids. After that, Desiree Alexander is coming back, and she's got a great show planned for us on how to create videos with your students. She's calling it Not Your Grandmother's Video. That'll be great. On May 13th, we have an awesome team coming, Paula Noggle, Billy Krakar, and Jerry Blumengarten, who you probably know as Cyberry Man. And they're going to be sharing all kinds of ideas about ways to get your students connected with other classes and students around the world. And then on May 20th, we have a children's author coming. Diane de las Casas is joining us, and she's going to be sharing some of the literacy lessons lessons that she has done as an artist in residence. So please join us any Saturday you can. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar, where you can sign up for a collaborate session. And as long as you make the session public, it's free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this link that's also in the Live Finder in the Resources tab at the very bottom. Uh, you can nominate yourself as a featured teacher as well. The video collection is in iTunes U of the art video archives. Uh, also in the Live Finder is the link for the Classroom 2.0 Live Survey. You can take this direct link or the link from the chat box. Uh, when you complete the survey, at the bottom you can request a professional development certificate and it will print out your name, thanks to Patty Russing for not only creating this option with the certificates but sending them out. Um, make sure though you request this to be sent to a personal email address, not a school address. Schools tend to block this from getting to you. Special thanks to Adam Bello, our special guest, to Steve Hargadon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in the show today. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>